Hello, students of statics. So in contrast to coordinate direction angles, also known as direction cosine angles, we can also express angles of a three-dimensional vector using spherical coordinates. I also think of this sometimes as like a planar projection system. Um, and we'll talk through this system. So we'll look at the exact same vector overall. So we're going to have our our y-axis over here to the right. We said that our z-axis for our right-hand coordinate system goes upwards, and our x-axis comes here out of the page. Here is our vector again, vector A, looking something like this. And with our ghost box, which just kind of helps us see what's going on, down to the x-y plane, over to y, over to x, back to that yz plane, to the z axes, something like that. Okay, so once again, positive x, positive y, positive z. Let's go ahead and add on those vector components. Put the vector components in brown again, a sub x, a sub y, a sub z. If you're wondering if you should always have to draw your vector arrows above your vector terms in a drawing, the reality is since we're labeling a vector right next to where the vector is, right? We know that this brown a sub y is this vector. It's a little bit redundant, but I'll leave it up to you. If you want to put the vector hats on top, that works fine. Um, but in a vector drawing, now that's, that's different than for a vector equation. Okay, so in vector algebra, we need to make sure we label all vectors appropriately with arrows above those variables. So here in spherical coordinates, we're going to actually measure this with two different angles. One of those angles is going to be related to the projection of this vector into the xy plane. Okay, so if I take A and fundamentally you shined a light vertically down in the negative z direction, you'd end up with a shadow underneath. We're going to call this A vector prime. Okay, the shadow of A down in that xy plane. And that um, typically the common way to measure uh, these spherical angles is that we're going to call this theta from the x-axis and then a second angle here which is going to be phi from the z-axis. Now noting that phi is exactly the same as theta sub z, the direction cosine angle that we talked about in the previous video. Okay, so that's both measured from the positive z-axis down to that vector. Okay, so we're going to do this in two different steps. The first triangle we're going to quantify is a right triangle, which basically goes from the z-axis out to this end of the vector. And so we could draw this a right triangle corner up along the z-axis. Okay, the z-axis and this line that's parallel to the xy plane, which is across the top here, those are going to be um, perpendicular. And so with this, I can write that my z component, a sub z, is going to be equal to, I have a right triangle, I have an angle phi, that angle phi is adjacent to a sub z, and so this is going to be the magnitude of a times the cosine of my angle phi. Okay, now notice in this, um, kind of parallelogram that I've created, and it is kind of a rectangular cube, that the length of a vector prime basically parallels that top line on top. So I can also write here that my magnitude of a prime is equal to a times the sine of phi, right? Sine being the opposite side of that right triangle, right? This yellow triangle. So let me just put some yellow next to these to show that we found the two legs of that yellow triangle. Now what we're going to do is we're going to come down into the xy plane, and in this xy plane I'm going to create one more right triangle, and it's going to be lying right down here. Now the right triangle corner, you can see if you can find that real fast, which corner is the right triangle corner? Is it the one back by the origin? Is it out here by the end of a prime, or is it over here along the x-axis? Turns out it is here. 
So there is my right triangle. And again, because this is a rectangular cube, AY is going to be equal to the length of that side of the triangle. And of course, AX, as we have it drawn over here on the, on the left side, is the magnitude of that other leg. Okay, so I'm gonna use this A prime as a hypotenuse in this new right triangle. And I can write that AX, and X is gonna be the adjacent side. So adjacent is gonna tell me my A prime times the cosine now of angle theta is going to equal AX. And then I can substitute in my a sine of phi okay so we'll make that blue and so we'll say now that a sine of phi times my cosine of theta all of that is equal to ax and then a y in a similar process we use a prime again as the hypotenuse a prime and this is going to be now the sine of theta, sine being the opposite side, and then do the substitution again. So AY equal to, um, again, my total magnitude of A sine of phi times the sine of theta. Okay, so the three different equations here we developed for the three components are kind of spread out, but here's one. Here is a second one, and here is a third one. Now, these equations are listed on some equation sheets. Uh, most books derive them. The challenging part of using these equations is what happens if you're not given phi, say, from the z-axis? What if you're given an angle from the xy plane up to that vector a? What if you're given this angle over here to a prime um, from a y or from the y-axis versus the x-axis? Then all of these sines and cosines are going to change. And so I think the best approach on these kind of problems is actually to just go ahead and derive these if you need to use them because it's not always going to be consistent. Once again, these three equations, while they're kind of a challenge to memorize, of course, you could put them on an equation sheet. I choose not to put them on an equation sheet just because not all problems are defined exactly the same with phi from z, essentially, and theta from x. Okay. So now once you have these components, what's really left in, or what's the next step to do things with these components. We could do a whole bunch of things with these components, but as far as how we're gonna use them, uh, going kind of through a sequence in our, our course content, is we're gonna take a resultant, okay? So a 3D um, vector resultant. Now, for two-dimensional vectors, we talked about that you could do a graphical method or also a vector algebra method. In three dimensions, we're going to pretty much stick to the vector algebra because trying to draw a three-dimensional um, vector triangle of these three different three-dimensional vectors in space gets really, really complicated and angles just get really messy. And so we're just going to use vector algebra and that tells us that our FR, this is a vector, is equal to the sum of all our forces. It doesn't matter if there's one, two, three, four. Um, and so we could also write this as, in bracket notation, the sum of all of our f sub x's, comma, the sum of all of the f sub y's, comma, the sum of all of our f sub z's. Okay, so simply adding together those components. Now we'll do a number of other things with these vectors as well, but for right now, let's just worry about taking those resultants. So hopefully that becomes a good overview of these polar, um, excuse me, spherical angle, angular system um, as we can identify the components of these vectors. Now, if you want to come up with the unit vectors using spherical coordinates, Fundamentally, you need to find these three components and then just divide by the total magnitude. And of course, you can get the total magnitude of A. Once you have these three components, you can use the Pythagorean theorem, although this is assuming you're getting those components from the total magnitude. So it's kind of chicken or the egg. But essentially, you could create the unit vector um, from the components if you needed to. Hope you're having an awesome day.